Welcome to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we develop and produce the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I'm your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And today, I'm going to be honest, Alex, getting a little sad. You told me that. I, I heard it. I brought you some tissues, <laughs> a little pack of them. But we are talking about a game that does tug on the heartstrings. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are going to be diving into Journey. And this game is one that kind of cropped up in this era of these PlayStation indie titles, mm -hmm. like kind of kind of booming. And, and, yes. and things that really challenged the status quo of gaming. It challenged that idea of like triple A's are the only way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be a Call of Duty member. You got to be a Battlefield, a Halo. You got to play something like that. But Journey slows it down and is able to truly tell a story without uttering a word. Yeah, this is in the early 2010s where we started seeing a rise of some indie titles mm -hmm. and things that were really, as you had said, uh, challenging the conventions of AAA. It was. You had major, major players investing in it now. Mm -hmm. You know, this wasn't the age of Super Meat Boy or Braid or Binding, or Binding of Isaac. This is kind of the, the stepping stones that those games laid, mm -hmm. allowing these other titles to be approached by Sony, by you know Namco, by Xbox, by all these different developers and publishers that had the money and the means to get this into fans, fans' hands. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and you know, funding, as we said, indie, but it's like a couple million dollar project, mm -hmm. but still compared to like 40 or $50 million going into games now. Absolutely. So let's jump into it. Let's, let's talk about Journey. I don't want to. I'm going to get sad. But let's right. do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So Journey is an indie adventure game developed by that game company and Santa Monica Studio and published by Sony Entertainment March 13th, 2012 in the U.S. and the next day in Europe. In Journey, you play as a robed figure wandering a vast desert. As you reach this first sand dune, the title screen drops with a mountain centered far in the distance. Your main goal. Ruins, obelisks, and puzzles guide your way as you gather runes and bits of cloth to progress further through your adventure. As you glide and slide your way across the sand, you may encounter other players online who can assist and even join you on your journey. The controls are simple and vary between jumping, moving, and chiming, which is actually the only way to communicate with others online as well as interact with the world around you. Mm -hmm. Journey is filled with both loneliness and optimism as you encounter others along your travels, find that hidden stash of cloth to build your bridge, and fly around with the half-squid, half-flying carpet from Aladdin. <laughs> the simplicity of Journey is what allows the game to flourish and earn its ability to tell a heartwarming, albeit sad story, all without saying a word. This is a game where the design is complex and simple at the same time, mm -hmm. it, which pretty crazy for me that, as you said, there's no communication no. other than a chime. There's, there's a chime that you can do like a little chirp, you can hold down the button to have a longer chime, mm -hmm. and those chimes echo throughout the area. And, you know, reading some of the stories online, I love to, you know, there's some YouTube comments I was going through as I was seeing some of them and people saying, this game was amazing. I met a random person. We actually played almost the whole game together, but then lost each other in this one part. And I waited for them for like mm. 15 minutes to see if they showed up and they did. And we uh, finished the game yeah. together. Mm -hmm. So things like that. And it's truly carried by the sound design and by the visuals. Mm -hmm. yes. And both of those marry so well together that it creates such a fun experience that you you wouldn't think on paper it would be. Yeah. Okay, we have a game. You don't communicate. Mm. You eventually go to the end. It, it, it's creative ways how you get there, but yeah, on paper, this game, I'm surprised that Sony was on board with it. And was willing to take the risk on it, mm -hmm. even though that game company had a few games under their belt. Yeah they were still titles that were very niche. So mm -hmm. for them to take the leap was fantastic. But let's let's go into it. Let's talk about, you know, wh who really developed this and mm -hmm. who is that game company? Yeah, that game company co-founder, Zingheng Chen, or, you know, known professionally as Genova Chen, started his video game journey at the University of Southern California's Interactive Media Division. Chen wanted to study animation and work at Pixar, but found himself creating video games. 
While he was attending USC, the university's media division wanted to show Electronic Arts, or, you know, EA, that they could make video games so that they could receive a grant from the company. Mm -hmm. He told the USC he had previous game development experience and would make games with some other students over the summer, just so as long as they were paid to do so. So, you know, we can probably get the grant, but you got to at least compensate us. Yeah, because uh, you need this money. We don't. Mm -hmm. We're helping you, so we need to be compensated for our work. Because at this time, Chen had already formulated some very ar archaic or basic games, but mm -hmm. knew his way around it. Yes. Now, EA was impressed with what Chen and his team had created and donated $8 million to the school. From there, USC started a grant that would award anyone $20,000 if they could pitch a game that was different than anything else on the market, mm -hmm. which I think it's awesome that, you know, just a couple kids did this for the summer and then here's $8 million and now they're like, okay, now we see the value in video games yes. more so than we thought we already did. Now, that game company was founded in 2006 by Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago after meeting at the University of Southern California while developing games together. Chen felt that Santiago was the only person whose input he could really trust, and that's why he wanted to start a game company with her. Prior to starting the company, the two created the game Cloud, an indie puzzle game funded by the USC grant. The game was rather popular, with Cloud receiving over 600,000 downloads, and fans were quick to email Chen, telling him that he should start his own video game company so that the games that you know he was making would become commercial and more accessible instead of just you know this one random download link. They got the idea for the name of the company while working on Cloud. They could not seem to find a web domain associated with the word cloud that was not taken. Pretty obvious in this era that <laughs> pretty much everything related to cloud, unless it's cloud, cloud, slash cloud, dot cloud. Um, I checked. That's taken. You know what? I was going to buy that today. <laughs> it's a shame. Uh, so, yeah. So, obviously, trying to find, and we'll see that about a lot of companies when they're trying mm -hmm. to find their first product. I know that happened with Resident Evil. That happened with several other games where their first choice was always just taken or flooded and would be really hard to find. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it didn't work. But one day, while teaching at USC, the co-founder of EA, Bing Gordon, kept referring to Katamari Damacy as, quote, that garbage game where you roll around garbage. Which is actually, I think, the best uh, description of that game. It pretty much is. <laughs> you take garbage no one wants, you make a bigger ball of garbage, and you take even bigger garbage, which includes people... <laughs> Which were pretty garbage. <laughs> and buildings and everything and yeah. whales. And so this offhanded and somewhat confusing description of Katamari inspired Chen to come up with that game company. You know, that, that game company. Makes sense. It worked fantastic for it. Mm -hmm. And one big thing that that game company had always tried to do was keep their team small mm -hmm. and keep kind of a niche together so that they could really work on a game and understand it. And there was never anything that tried to get in their way of artistic visions or the artistic project. Well, too many cooks in the kitchen. Yes. Uh, especially for a smaller uh, indie team where it's not like, okay, we have an art director overlooking this whole thing. His word is kind of what you go with. Instead, it's like everyone's probably doing a little bit of something else. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't have divisions. You had mm -hmm. kind of an all-hats crew yeah. where everyone could work on a piece of this, a piece of that, and understand the full project and the scope of it instead of just being, okay, I'm just the texture artist. Yeah. Okay, I'm just programming the movement. Mm -hmm. you, you all work together for this. And that, I think, is really what makes indie titles and indie studios so far removed from AAA titles. Mm -hmm. It just it creates, I don't know, it, it makes you feel warm and like you're inviting into the game. Yes. Instead of like AAA, it's more of a theatrical Mm -hmm. release and, and at the end of the day development it's purely for money how do we monetize mm -hmm. this and make this profitable as compared to we see you know with this it's kind of a different story yeah so in 2006 the studio would sign on to a three game deal with sony for the playstation 3 the first two games they would develop were flow and flower flow had you play as an amoeba that would swim around water eating orbs and growing larger so we've seen a lot of those mobile games come out mm -hmm. um like icho and all those other ones where like you, you it's basically snake yeah you get bigger start to eat more things very similar to sport i, I did well. not even make that connection to snake whatsoever literally snake mm -hmm. it's indie snake indie snake flower had the player controlling the wind, attempting to pick up flower petals along the way. That one I have played, and that's, again, a very relaxing... It's beautiful. Just swooshy, swooshy game. Mm -hmm. Fantastic time. 
And both of these games obviously were not traditional video games. They followed suit more along the lines of Cloud, by breaking the mold of traditional games at the time. And with those new ideas came many happy fans. It was time for that game company to start on their final project for Sony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it yeah, so it's rocky development. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not expect this whatsoever. But let's talk about that development itself because, as I said, it's, it's going to be an adventure like Journey itself. Let's start with a quote from Genova Chen in an interview with Gama Sutra. So, quote, we wanted to make an online game that brought an emotion that has never been done before in online games. If you look around at online games in the console market, it's pretty obvious that no other games give you this feeling of connection with each other, of understanding. With only seven people, development for the game began in spring of 2009 after they wrapped up Flower. Sony had given that game company one year to make Journey, but, like most games, it ended up taking three years from start to finish. And we see that with a lot uh, of games. Mm -hmm. You know, you start on an art project, the art project is more, you know, you start with just your macaroni, mm -hmm. now you gotta paint the macaroni, now you gotta get your glitter glue, mm -hmm. and then you also have to paint, you know, Starry Night. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it starts off, you know, on paper as something that works really well, but obviously with smaller studios and just adding to the what the game is, there's so much that you can put into it. Now, some of this we will, I will say, is not that game company's fault. Sony has a little bit to blame. Yeah. We're gonna learn that the network went down a little bit. There's some, you know, some hands that came in for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but it took a while to make to really bring this passion project to fruition. Mm -hmm. And honestly, one thing that I think really stuck out when they started this game was that the art early on in development was more inspired by uh, Giorgio De Chirico who also inspired Team Eco's Japanese cover art for their game. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so very much, and apparently, as I'm learning more in this gaming world, Eco and Shadow of the Colossus are basically what Dead Rising was to Halo for us. <laughs> uh, and they've established everything. Well, especially, yeah, because the Eco cover art uh, for, for the uh, Japanese release mm -hmm. is beautiful. It is a work of art like the game, and then you see the U.S. version where it's like these crude in game graphics that they've put on it. Yeah. It's and, so bizarre. And Chirico's known for that lonely mm -hmm. aspect. He, the, the art that he creates is just so lonely and wanting, I guess. Is you're, this. A, you're, in a, you're alone in a grand environment. Yes. Um, you, are, you are a part of, you're, you're the small part of a big picture. Absolutely. I think that's literally the description. Uh, now, the first prototype for what would become Journey was created in Flash as a 2D side-scrolling game, having players work together to ascend from one area to the next in each level. The next prototype was a top-down game that could be played by four players at once. With four players, the studio felt that they were not creating that real sense of connection. Both prototypes were thrown out, and the studio would look to more simplistic forms of inspiration. Yeah, then it just becomes a four-player co-op where you're just doing puzzles. It, I don't think they're going... It didn't fit that, like, you and I connecting mm -hmm. the game. It was more so... All right, let's do these puzzles. Oh, that was fun, guys. It was a great I, game session. I can only care about one person at any given time. <laughs> That's not myself. So, yeah. It's tough. And one thing, as I said, that they were struggling to do with that was creating that connection. That's what... That's basically what this game was. That was, mm -hmm. it was, it was the first words written on that whiteboard, I would assume. You know, if I was... Connection. A, and creating. So it was connection slash creating. They went... Flip it. Good. <laughs> Creating connection. So Journey's main inspiration is that feeling of hiking in the wilderness. Chen felt that when you were hiking in the wild, a place that could be dangerous, finding someone else on the trail can bring a sense of relief and safety. Unless they're dangerous. But you don't know yet. <laughs> Sometimes they're very nice. Then they are dangerous. He started doing some market research and met two astronauts along the way. They described to him how it felt during their trip to the moon. They were not distracted by anything else going on, they were focused simply on the then and now. They were more emotionally charged and became almost religious afterwards. Yes, that was a rabbit hole I went into is that even they've talked about basically everyone, I think it's either gone in space or has been, I think specifically been on the moon, mm -hmm. um, whether they're atheist or anything like that. They come back s not religious, but spiritual. Spiritually charged. And they feel like there's something else because... It, I can only imagine what it's like. There's no sound, no nothing. You're on the moon, and you realize that in the grand scheme of things, you don't matter. 
yeah. when you're when you see when you look the back universe. At, when you see the universe, you look back at the earth that you were on mm-hmm. and just you can't see anyone, you can't see anything. Yeah. And you realize how small and minute you are. And that's really what journey makes you feel. Mm -hmm. And Chen also spent 12 months reading sociology books to obtain a better understanding of emotions. He decided that he wanted to strip as many distractions from the game as possible, including the HUD. This also meant not showing another player's username. Sony, however, was not a fan of this and told them they had to display the username, especially for online titles. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be known. You want to be like, oh... You know, there's there's teabagger seventy two over there. Like, that can't was, wait to like play th- with them. That was literally it. They're like, it's supposed to be a warm game, and then you see Poon Slayer sixty nine, and they're like, that kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah, and that game company explained their pitch and their sense of wonder and loneliness to Sony, stating that showing usernames took away the sense of neutral connection. So not only was you know taking out the rude usernames, but not seeing usernames pop up everywhere and mm-hmm. just randomly running into someone and just chiming, it created almost like a very childlike connection as well. Mm-hmm. Like you're in kindergarten, like, you know, sharing your crayons with someone and like you make yeah. that connection. It's very much on that realm. Yes. And Sony eventually understood what they were going for and accepted their HUD change and accepted, you know, the no usernames. Mm-hmm. Chen wanted to innovate the online gaming experience. Since most online games at the time were shooters, he wanted a positive experience from a multiplayer game. He was also an avid World of Warcraft player, and the more he played it, the more he realized that he never had any connections with anyone that he encountered. Mm -hmm. The experience just made him feel lonely. He would also experience players feeling better than other players on their armor and their gender. So... You know, as we talked about, the, the everyone in the uh, journey looks the same. Yes. But, you know, someone's going to show up way better armor or something like that, and they have that sense of superiority. Yes, now. souped up level. I've mm-hmm. got the legendary armor. I've got my mount that I need. You know, I've beaten the game. I'm going to mm-hmm. crush these noobs. This was not that. This was seeing someone who was exactly like you, and mm-hmm. you just communicate with that chime that was such a simplistic element. And we're going to talk about you know, why the chimes stuck and why they got rid of any ideas of text chat, voice Mm -hmm. chat, thumbs up, thumbs down, any interactions at all Mm -hmm. that just became the chime. And, and, you know, we talked about armor, but as well gender, because, you know, if sometimes a woman gets in the chat, Mm -hmm. people are going to respond negatively to it. And so he said he wanted to prevent that ever happening in this game. Absolutely. The character for the game needed to be as neutral as possible. No gender, age, race, nothing. It needed to act as an avatar for the player and anyone they encountered. To further create the sense of connection, the studio decided to have a game take place mainly in a desert. That way, there wasn't anything too distracting in the background. Mm -hmm. I think at one point they talked about maybe like on a beach or something, but you don't want to do a thing. You just want to relax on a beach, so just... Yeah, I'm see, not going to play the game. Beach is fun sand. Desert, <laughs> desert is bad sand. <laughs> that is the best description I've heard yet of it. Yeah. So let's dive into what the story and gameplay kind of truly tell. And how mm-hmm. was it inspired? What built it? So the story is roughly based on Professor Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey and Confucius's Eight Stages of Life. This story is broken up into three parts. The Call to Adventure, Journey to an Unknown World, and return. The story is structured around transformation, which fits perfectly with the overall theme of the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as gamers themselves, a lot of the team working on the game knew that they did not have, you know, time to dedicate to a 40 hour plus campaign. So they made a journey a very casual experience and Mm -hmm. made it a shorter game compared to most that were out. Yeah. And and I think that's great because it is only a couple hour campaign Mm -hmm. and that's probably your first playthrough just exploring everything uh so i i do appreciate that they did that yeah you need to tell this concise story over over 40 hours of side quests and other people you run into you know it just kind of Mm -hmm. muddies it this is to the point tells you what's going on and gets you involved into it Mm -hmm. and so that game company they also needed to make walking fun they decided to add in things like flying and surfing on the sand to keep the gameplay more engaging. Yes. To enhance this experience, the studio took a trip to the Pismo Dunes. This wasn't for photo references, but rather to get a feeling for walking and sliding in the sand. Mm-hmm. So they, they actually went out and 
you know, became the avatar? Like, what would it be out here to be like running around? Like, do you feel slogged down? Mm-hmm. How is the sliding it like feel? Like, does does sand kick up? So they they got some really great references just to get in the mindset of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just yeah, as you had said, see how like particles of sand interact with this. And if it's windy, what are they gonna do? Like, I think that's genius that they did that instead of just saying, I assume this is gonna how this is how it's gonna work or play another game with sand physics in there as well. Or take the idea of like snowboarding, but just Mm -hmm. transfer it to sand. Yeah. You know, kind of get the feel of exactly Mm -hmm. what your environment's going to be. Absolutely. Now, that game company did not want AIs in the game because you won't be as attached to them as you would just another player. Mm -hmm. Human connection, above all else, was the basis for the game. Human connection that would be driven simply by compassion and understanding. There were no real goals other than helping one another. Gameplay itself also needed to be simple. So simple that the studio removed arms for the character since having them would make the players want to pick up objects. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Half time, that's all I do with my arms. If I'm bored, I just go and I pick things up. (laughs) Just pick stuff up. (laughs) He just presses X wherever he goes. (laughs) What's more interesting is is how they tested this game, though. You know, testing this this, uh, player connection. Mm -hmm. That game company did conduct a public beta but this was more for quantitative data rather than seeing how many bugs were in the game. They wanted to see how many times players encountered other players. The biggest takeaway from this beta was camera controls. It helped the studio dial down for the six axis uh, control scheme. Mm -hmm. Now, as Jesse had mentioned earlier in the episode, it looks like it's gonna be all desert roses (laughs) and just, you know, cactus drinks and fun stuff out there, but there was some drama in the studio. Oh yeah. And since this was the studio's first online game, they struggled often with it. Creating the cloth physics, new code, sand particles, and animation caused delays and drama within the studio. The studio was split between the passion to make the game great and the idea that they would run out of money before they could even complete it. This would lead to a lot of harsh criticism from those making the game. This chaotic and toxic behavior was derailing the project entirely. They needed to take a good, long look at themselves and change this. The developers started working on communication, took lunch dates, and worked less. In an interview with IGN, producer Robin Hunick stated, quote, We gave ourselves permission to be human, to have lives, to sleep. Granted, this did lead to more delays, but it brought clarity to the developers. And luckily, Sony understood this and granted them the delays that they needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was less about crunch, more about relax. Because you get tense, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, nothing sounds good. Well, and and I would say it's even more than that. It's Mm -hmm. it's more so the burnout. Yes. And the when you're working on a project like this, and you do hit crunch or you hit walls, not enough people, even in just like a regular office job, Mm -hmm. you need to take a break to get away from what you're doing, refresh your brain, refresh your body. And get back into it and have a whole new mindset. Mm-hmm. And they yeah. just weren't doing that. They they just had this passion project and they're like, it has to be perfect. It has to be perfect without ever taking a day for themselves for a long while. Yeah. And having that small team that's, they all share that same passion. They want it to happen. But again, a lot of them, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel is closing. Mm-hmm. And they weren't yeah. sure this was even going to come out. Yes. Yeah, so, and, you know, it's crazy going from four to five hours of sleep a night to eight. Mm-hmm. It changes your perspective on a lot of things. Well, and, and to not eat lunch at your desk, you know, to mm-hmm. go out with a, with a coworker and just chat for yes. an hour. Mm-hmm. You know, you need those refreshers in, in all your lives. So if you're not taking those, take them. Take them. Uh, but yeah, so, so this really refreshed it. And obviously having a publishing partner like Sony that says, understandable, we'll give you those delays. Mm-hmm. It saved the game. Absolutely. Because I will say that a lot of game development studios say that Sony is very good to work with. Because mm-hmm. I think they, when they see potential, they let you roll with it. Yeah. But, Otherwise, they wouldn't really invest in what you're mm-hmm. doing. Yeah. But this meant, though, that this crossed the one-year barrier for development. Mm-hmm. So during the second year of development, a playtester got to around the ending of the game where your character, the Pilgrim, falls in the snow and the game froze. And mm-hmm. so he thought that the, the uh, character died and he got really saddened by it. Now, this player was moved by the idea that the player dies before reaching the summit. Essentially, that's what he thought the game was going to be. There Mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, you didn't reach your goal. That made Chen and the rest of the team emphasize making a game an emotional experience. Showing the player's dead body at the end of the game was a hot topic for debate at the studio. 
It was only in the last two weeks of development that they decided not to show the body Mm -hmm. at the very end of the game. But as development was still in that second year mark, many of the developers were working late into the night, skipping out on their salaries just to get the game done. Because at this point, the studio missed the release date by a long shot. They they ran out of money at this point. And that's Mm -hmm. why people are just saying, listen, we'll, we'll just basically work for free at this point. Let's just get this done. Eventually, they were faced with either shipping the game as is or continue to improve it and making it something truly emotional. The last year or so of development is when Journey truly came together. For a while, they were struggling on making the game the same experience for everyone. And at one point during play tests, players were being rather mean to each other, which is the opposite of what the studio was trying to achieve with this game. Players could bump into one another and jump on top of each other's heads. Players were using this to push each other off of cliffs, killing them essentially, because you can't do that in the final build, and that was going to be a thing for a while. You can just kind of nudge someone Mm -hmm. and and push them aside. The developers claimed that these were mainly Call of Duty players, but the team also had the habit of doing this as well. Chen said this made him disappointed in humanity, which makes sense because, yeah, it's like, oh, these people who say they play Call of Duty are doing this, and then when... The studio is also doing it. They're also killing each other. Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) well, look at everything this. (laughs) By the end of development, they were working past their third year mark and pulling money from their own funds just to keep the project going, which led the company to bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. The game was finally finished February 2012, created by a total of 18 people. It was estimated to cost around three to four million dollars to create. When the game was finished, everyone at that game company got a scarf that resembled the cloth on the Pilgrims, Mm -hmm. you know, your main character of the game. When the final build of the game was complete, 25 testers played the game, three of which cried when they completed it. It's definitely an emotional experience. And, you know, I say from from my first playthrough a while back, you can definitely see it and and Mm -hmm. going through the play test. And because a lot of people I know with it might have even had emotional baggage just going into the game. And it brings that to the forefront mm-hmm. crazily enough. Yes. Uh, so it's it's definitely something that really impacts people. And for some reason, I don't know the magic behind this game, it does leave that impact and mm-hmm. brings it to the forefront and really challenges people to understand the game and understand what the story is trying to tell, but adapt it to yourself, oddly mm-hmm. enough. Yeah, you can project so much onto this game. Mm -hmm. And what we also project are the great market sales coming up. (laughs) Um, And continuing on, you know, with the talks of earlier with with running out of money, not having that budget, it ended up really affecting the marketing at first. Mm -hmm. Because there was next to no marketing for the game, mainly due to that lack of budget. Instead, that game company relied on the players from their past games like Flower and Flow to purchase the game. Since the start of the studio, fans of the past games have created a strong and devoted community that would play and discover new things within the game over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. After the game was released, no marketing was required to promote the different ports of the game. That game company saw how successful it was on the PlayStation Network when it first released with, you know, no marketing. Mm -hmm. So they decided to continue putting no money into any kind of promotional budget and just allow word of mouth, mm-hmm. friend of friend, and internet forums to run with it. Yeah, it's it's not often where there's basically literally no marketing. Like there's sometimes there's some stuff, but they're like, we have no money to do this. And mm-hmm. Sony was more so we're paying for the development of this game. We're not gonna be doing the marketing or anything like that. We're just gonna put it on PSN and and let it go. Essentially, I think it's a game too that would be very hard to market. Mm-hmm. I think how, how do you create besides doing trailers? How else do you create a marketing campaign to tell a story with no dialogue, no real character, except for like this persona that you play as a pilgrim? Mm -hmm. I think it's very hard. And I think this is really the only way to kind of do it is let the community drive it and let their stories drive the idea of it. Let YouTubers talk about it. Let friends of friends talk about it. Let that person who owns a PlayStation down the road, tell you about it. Mm -hmm. And that's how the success really came about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think for me, going on talking about like the friends of friends playing it and continuing, it's it's what drove me to start to play Journey. Mm -hmm. And so I want to dive into more of the gameplay and a little bit about, I think, why it makes it so emotional or emotionally attaching. Mm -hmm. And it starts out, you know, as as your pilgrim, as I described earlier in the episode, you're traveling 
to this mountain in the distance. It's the one thing you can see. Mm -hmm. So you're stranded in the desert. Let's go towards that. There has to be something. You know, mm -hmm. you're in your mind. I'm, I'm thinking that's what you would do. That's what I would do in the desert. Yes. Go towards a big thing. Might be people. Might be cool mountain stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, buried treasure. Who knows? So as you start to continue your way through, the, the mechanics start to develop themselves from walking through these kind of like runes or gravestones or you know, little elements that you'll see throughout the game mm -hmm. where you'll eventually learn that chime to activate them. That'll mm -hmm. activate these puzzles. And as you progress through the game, you'll not only learn how to kind of jump with it, but do these multiple jumps where you glide, your cape around mm -hmm. you kind of opens up using those bits of cloth that you find that are kind of these 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 power elements yeah, that you'll use up with it. You're like leveling up essentially. Yeah, as, as you keep finding these, and not only that, those cloth bits you'll find in different ruins or like these broken temples or just ruined society allows you to continue the game, building bridges, opening doorways, mm -hmm. uh, just just expanding the game out. Now the game is not on rails. It's, it's just a continuation towards this mountain. So it mm -hmm. allows you to explore all around and discover these puzzles as you go, which eventually unlock or progress through to these different cloth creatures, some that kind of resemble stingrays or mm -hmm. like kind of birds of flight that will travel with you and allow you to fly and just feel this openness and the score changes with it and it continues your journey as yes. the game is as the game says. And as we get closer and closer to that mountain, we start to go through some different areas. Yeah. And we start to get to almost more of what was that old civilization mm -hmm. or an idea of what that old civilization was as we eventually make our way under the mountain only to understand those mechanics we've been learning and the friendliness we've seen, you know, just kind of these creatures helping you and going along the way, there is still this terror or this darkness about it. this, this malevolence yes. that's still present that's, that you didn't expect. No. And this is where we start to get into a quasi combat scenario trying mm -hmm. to dodge these kind of serpent snakes mm -hmm. that are made from the same cloth idea. Yes. So it's it's kind of this this I uh, this same elements used throughout it and I love that they use that mm -hmm. because it makes that simplicity still something that's there that still recognizable texture or idea that can kind of be construed as however you want. Mm -hmm. Whether you think of that as like this loneliness or depression or anger or something else along the journey, it's a different game changer. Mm -hmm. And as you progress through there, dodging that and going through these ruins, you know, the game starts to develop more and you start to think, okay, what's going on with this? What are these ruins? What is this under the mountain? As you then find your way through there, you've made it, you've made it through to kind of start to be a snowy biome, snowy element. Mm -hmm. And that snowy element then challenges you to really work with the controls, hide behind objects, hide behind the snow. As the wind's coming as at the, you. As the wind's coming at you and trying to push you back only to get you to progress further. So yeah. really the, the gameplay is honestly what ends up selling this. Mm -hmm. It's so simplistic from just a couple button pushes uh, to feeling that that little hit of dopamine every time you, you finish one of those puzzles up. Yes. Or find the cloth pieces or have fun with traveling through the air or gliding down those sand dunes. There's just so much elements that are added in that. And the music that interacts the with music it Music that as interacts, well. that changes with it. As the sun changes, you know, when you're able to go up an abandoned tower or through mm -hmm. these little ruins of different, you know, that could have been somewhat of an idea of a, of a coliseum or, or you know, moratorium area. Yeah. It's, it's really, really well done in those areas. And I think that's what sells the gameplay mm -hmm. is it's simplistic it's anything you could almost like find on like the app store of just a tap, tap, tap button, make yeah, your way through yeah, something. Yeah. But they've advanced that so far to intertwine these elements and intertwine different pieces of gameplay that, as you have said, tie in the soundtrack, tie in the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh sound of you like going through <laughs> the sand and the gliding and the chimes that go and the orchestral pieces that hit in different areas Yeah, that hit that weird emotional tone. Yeah. That and, emotional bone you have in your mm -hmm. body, it tingles the whole that's time. All, it's every bone in my body. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I said that this game is simplistic mm -hmm. and yet complex at the same time. It is. And it's a masterpiece of storytelling 
that doesn't utter a word. Mm -hmm. And very rarely do you find pieces like that that aren't contrived, that aren't there specifically to show you, look, we don't say anything. And our story is yeah. so deep. But this has done it in a way that lets you unveil the story yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear cut the first playthrough. But then when you play through again, you see these other little elements in there. You start to think, as, as I said, like my idea with those snakes or serpents was more of like depression, loneliness, imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. I ideas of it. That's kind of keeping you down to not achieve where you're going. And I saw that as like a negative to a positive. Some people saw that as like the last kind of throws or last kind of hardships before you pass. You can kind of, I like that you can interpret it kind of any way you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I definitely say, as you had said, there is a lot of interpretation, but there is as you had also said, a, a clear cut story for the most part that you can interpret certain ways and then other ways are very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Now in the world of journey, there used to be an ancient civilization that had used an energy source that was in the form of a cloth that is made up of life. Mm -hmm. Eventually most of the cloth was used up. So other beings were sacrificed in order to make more of this cloth. This led to nearly everyone being killed or dying off. The game starts with your nameless character, who you know, who is a pilgrim, waking up in a desert with seemingly no direction to go. There is a mountain miles away, which is the largest thing in sight. Thus, your character makes your way towards it. During the game, they will be accompanied by cloth-like living creatures that fly along their journey. As the player reaches the end of each area, a white creature that resembles the main character comes down and recants past events and gives you a glimpse into the future events through hieroglyphs. The white figure is simply known as an ancestor. It's unclear exactly who these ancestors are. Mm -hmm. As the character continues through the desert, they eventually find themselves underground in what could be the remains of an ancient civilization. At one point, you know, as you had mentioned, flying mechanic serpent-like creatures emerge, and the player must avoid them as they move further into the abandoned ruins. Eventually, the pilgrim makes their way back outside and is now at the base of the mountain. But the terrain is covered in snow, with the wind becoming more and more harsh. As you continue to ascend the mountain, the cold weather makes traveling more treacherous, slowing the pilgrim down. Things only turn progressively worse when the flying serpent returns. Nearing the top of the mountain, the pilgrim finds themselves in an all-out storm. While moving further, the pilgrim collapses in the snow, as you know we had talked about earlier in that, that frozen section of the game mm -hmm. that a playtester had played. Then, all of the ancestors that it had met along the way appear above its body. The pilgrim is then shot into the sky, now flying and sliding closer to the top of that mountain. After all the hardships, the pilgrim reaches the top of the mountain, following the light, and the game fades to white. The entire journey was crossing over to the other side. A light is shot from the top of the mountain, and the light is sent back to the beginning of the desert, right where the game takes place. Mm -hmm. So there is that, you know, you and I had discussed this for a while, that interpretation of, is this death? Mm -hmm. Or is that the ending, you know, reincarnation? Uh, I think a lot of the interpretation, for the most part, is it's death. People have said, well, are we in purgatory now? You know, were we, I've read so many actual like theories of like, okay, we were humans, but when we go to purgatory, we turn into this pilgrim and, and that's when we're going to the other side. It's really interesting. Or on a darker note, you're getting turned into cloth. Yes. For other yeah. pilgrims to use. I didn't you. like that one. I didn't like that one. That's what, that I, one, made. That That's one what ma I made up. <laughs> I don't like that one. That one makes me sad. <laughs> sad you're now just sadder. You know, just a bit of cloth flying about. <laughs> yeah, you're just kind of a, you know, a cog in the machine, essentially. No, but I love it. I, I love the idea of, of having the mechanical serpents that are kind of that change of element that challenge you along the way. And it creates, I think, a, a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of the first sense of urgency we really get. Yeah, that that gets you there. And so I, I just love every element that they've added into this and that we do start to break out and see that story that can be interpreted anyway. Is this are these ancestors um, of the past? Are they a different worldly force? Are they taking on our form mm -hmm. to talk to us? You know, what is the idea with that? You know, and as we said, is this death? Is this purgatory? Is this a rebirth? Is this a sick, twisted game of cloth or is this? can be interpreted as, you know, kind of like um, 
uh, the guy who has to roll the stone all the way up the hill every time and it rolls back down. Mm -hmm. Is it that? Is it we restart a journey every time and can never reach the end. Our, our final destination? Mm -hmm. You know, so I love that that can be interpreted any way in a very spiritual sense or even in a very concrete sense. And I think that's done to really allow the player to, I mean, don the, pil the pilgrim identity. Yes. Not having any other thing besides like little eyes and it's like cape that flaps. There's little chicken legs and that's about it. That's it. Yeah. And I think everything that was in the game was perfect. I don't hear a lot of people saying they should have done this or this, mm -hmm. but there was plenty that was cut out of the game. And Journey's development was not without its faults, which left many concepts thrown out because they did not align with the core values of the game. One of the main elements cut was the ability to communicate with another player through voice chat, text chat, or a thumbs up and a thumbs down. Negativity from certain playtesters caused the studio to cut this function from the game. Another sequence that was cut was how the player went through the ending of the game. Originally, the ending of the game where the player reaches the summit would have been an on-rails experience. You weren't really controlling it, more cinematic. Mm -hmm. But that game company decided that the player needed to go through it themselves, actually push that joystick forward and, and actually experience it and go into the light. Mm -hmm. The Pilgrim in the game also went through several different design iterations before they settled on the final design. Some concepts that were never used had the pilgrim as a character you know made of blocks uh, a nomad ninja a robed owl a chicken shaped cloth and a swan shaped cloth but you know as we said they needed a simple design so more of just this very simple rectangle silhouette essentially and finally like three things that were also cut was the game was going to be in a forest at one point before they switched it to the desert uh, they cut a jump button from the game and then for the PS3 version, they were shooting for 60 FPS, but never achieved that. Yeah, we eventually do see a higher frame rate on different versions, but just couldn't achieve it for the first one. Mm -hmm. um, so it was stuck at that. Yeah. Next up, let's talk about the music, the soundtrack, the tones that went with this mm -hmm. that made Journey what it is today. Yes. The Journey original soundtrack was composed and orchestrated by Austin Wintry, who previously worked on that game company's game, Flow. Before development had even started, Director Genova Chen asked Wintry to compose a track that would be the overall theme for the game. The two discussed the work of Joseph Campbell, whose scholastic philosophy influenced the music for Star Wars and The Matrix and the like. After being told to, quote, write a theme that summarizes all of this, Wintry had already come up with his idea before he reached his car to leave the meeting. He called his cellist friend, Tina Gao, to record it that same day. He then sent the studio a demo track, and they loved it so much, they made one of their first trailers to fit the song. This was the easiest song to write for the soundtrack, according to Wintry. Wintry worked very closely with sound designer Steve Johnson for the entire game's three-year development. There was an overall back and forth between Wintry and the rest of the studio as well. He would send them a track for a level, they would create the level and send it back, then he would recompose the song. Wintry decided to write dynamically, at the beginning of the game in order to wipe the emotional palette clean for the players. The game's music changes based on the player's action, and the musical experience all differs depending on whether you play the game alone, sometimes with another player, or almost always with another player. Mm -hmm. Cello represents the player. The reassuring bass flute represents the ancestors or elder guides. The orchestra is there to give the player a feeling that there is something bigger at play than just wandering the desert and the harp and viola represent the online companions. Funny enough, all of the music was composed using Wintry's crappy $50 Casio 44 keyboard with MIDI input. Yeah, and I love the idea that he assigns instruments to elements and players mm -hmm. in this. I think that's genius, and you know, that, uh, you know, I guess theme of the game is powerful. Like, I, I think this soundtrack, uh, especially being composed on that keyboard is phenomenal. Now, during an interview with the sixaxis.com, Wintry would describe the soundtrack as being, quote, musically like a big cello concerto where you are the soloist and all the rest of the instruments represent the world around you, including other players. The music at the game utilizes the orchestra, but Wintry was hesitant to call it orchestral. It has heavy electronic aspects to it, but still features the cello as the primary focus. The cello started off immersed in a sea of electronic sound. 
where it was not really discovered itself, and it gradually starts to emerge, eventually transcending and disappearing back into the fabric, except the fabric has since turned into a full orchestra. All music heard within the soundtrack was recorded by someone because to Wintry, quote, music is the most emotional and meaningful when played by a person. The Journey official game soundtrack would release on October 9th, 2012 through something else Music Works for $5 and would include 18 tracks for a total of 58 minutes and 34 seconds. The soundtrack would later release on a two-piece vinyl set for $35. Do you have that vinyl set? No. Ah, next time. Video Games Live featured several performances with the music of Journey, included in the concerts, the premiere of which was conducted by Wintry himself. The soundtrack debuted at the top 10 in 20 countries and at number one in eight countries. In January of 2016, Fifth House Ensemble launched a Kickstarter campaign for a Journey live performance tour. The $5,000 goal for a four-city tour was met in just two hours and finished with over 40000 raised, resulting in an addition of other cities in the tour. It was also the number one album on the Japanese charts. The Journey official game soundtrack would win several Video Game Soundtracks of the Year awards, as well as Video Game Soundtrack of the Decade award. Journey would also be nominated for a Grammy in the Best Score Soundtrack for Visual Media category, the first video game in history to do so. Mm-hmm. Stacking Wintry against stacking Wintry against the greats such as Hans Zimmer, Howard Shore, and John Williams. Overall, Wintry was afraid of postpartum depression when the project ended because of how much he loved working on it and helping bring people together through the music. As we said, uh, the soundtrack is amazing. It, it establishes such an orchestral, beautiful score mm-hmm. that tells a story. It's reminiscent, in my opinion, to to old scores, let's just say Flight of the Bumblebee, that, yeah. that tells a story mm-hmm. that has emotion, that has drive, that has feel, where every piece, you can feel it as a character. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you see a lot of that in like Spanish guitar ballads and things along that nature, that when you're plucking it, and you're playing the guitar with it, you feel the ramp of energy. You mm-hmm. feel the characters. Yeah, and I mean, this is this was a situation where I listened to the soundtrack first before I play the game, because I, I do that sometimes. If I want to play a game, say that day at work, I just pull mm-hmm. up the soundtrack, and I was sold from the soundtrack mm-hmm. before I ever touched the game because of how beautiful it, it is. And that's one thing that I really love to harp on for indie titles. I think triple A's focus on their own thing to sell the game. Mm-hmm. Indies have some of the most diverse and interesting scores. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that I do own a record for, I've bought, is Valhalla, uh, which is this pixelated bar talking simulator game. Uh, not for everybody. It's interesting. It's kind of like a visual novel in a way. Yeah. But the music is so interesting and so diverse and so fun. Um, it's very much like a lo-fi element to it, but futuristic-y and cyberpunk in some ways, but hmm. slow and fast in others. So soundtracks to me, like you said, really can sell a game that I may not know much about. Yeah. Or that's a, uh, an indie title uh, that's just done so well. Yeah. Another one uh, to bring up with that is uh, a game that recently came out from uh, Digital Digital Devolver is Loop Hero, a super pixelated, endless game where you just travel around a loop doing scripted battles, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like uh, turn-based stuff. You don't control any of it. You just control the elements of the world. Hmm. And the soundtrack and the score is done so well and gets you so hyped when a boss shows up or when you're like crushing the circle. It's mm-hmm. so well done. So bringing it back to Journey, to stand up to amazing cinema greats mm-hmm. for this little fun game that just tells this pilgrim story is so fantastic and opens opens the door, breaks that glass ceiling to get games into the arts medium mm-hmm. of, of like respected cinema. You know, cinema is always felt like a highbrow thing at times. And yeah. video games are kind of like this play, you you play it in your basement. Yeah. So I, th- I think now that we're, especially in 2012, breaking that and getting soundtracks up there and mm-hmm. paving the way for it is such a beautiful thing. 
Absolutely. And again, it's it's one of the better video game soundtracks that have came out within the past 10 years, if not, you know, much longer than that. Hey, it might just be a decade. One, yeah. It won. <laughs> now, this game did have several release versions that we had mentioned that none of which really got marketing. It first came out on the PlayStation Network, but then it had a PS3, you know, physical release in a collector's edition that included Flow, Flower and Journey along with creator commentary and a 30-minute documentary, along with three mini-games. Next, it came out on the PS4, and anyone who owned the PS3 version could receive the PS4 version for free. It was ported by the studio Tricky Pixels, who had a lot of difficulty doing so because they stated that the game was, quote, a masterpiece of PlayStation 3 programming. Mm -hmm. And then the final two, you can get it on mobile, and you can get it on PC through the Epic Game Store or Steam. Now, at release, the game became the fastest-selling PlayStation Network game at the time. It earned a 92 out of 100 on Metacritic, and won Game of the Year from the 2012 Game Developers Choice Awards, as well as Best Audio, Best Downloadable Game, Best Game Design, and the Innovative Award. Kind of one of everything, essentially. A little bit of it all. The studio has won over 30 awards from Journey in total. Now, after IGN awarded Journey with Game of the Year, several IGN employees would email Chen congratulating him. He said in the moment, he felt such a sense of love. Chen also received over 800 emails about the game from fans. Most of them were very personal. One player had lost her father after a battle with cancer. She would send an email to Chen stating, quote, Your game practically changed my life. It was the most fun I had with him since he had been diagnosed. My father passed away in the spring of 2012, only a few months after his diagnosis. Weeks after his death, I could finally return myself to playing video games. I tried to play Journey, and I could barely get past the title screen without breaking down in tears. In my dad's, and in my own experience with Journey, it was about him, and his journey to the ultimate end. And I believe we encountered your game at the most perfect time. I want to thank you for the game that changed my life. The game whose beauty brings tears to my eyes. Journey is quite possibly the best game I've ever played. I continue to play it, always remembering what joy it brought, and joy it continues to bring. I am Sophia, I am 15, and your game changed my life for the better. Isn't that so crazy? Like, that is... Wow. Like the fact that this is helping Sophia here cope with the loss of her father. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think they ever were like, let's make a video game where we help people cope with death. But here it is. Yeah, they wanted to bring some emotion to it. You know, they kind of had the players, oh, it's sad that, you know, the, the, the character passes or what's happening. You know, what's that, what's that motif? What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. But to actually have people, especially having, you know, that, that nameless, figureless pilgrim mm -hmm. that you can then personify yourself onto it and mm -hmm. and to work through that and that this is her way to deal with the loss of her father but also to celebrate his life yeah to celebrate this journey that they had together mm -hmm. with it like having both of them be able to play it and having her you know at that young be able to come back to the game mm -hmm. get back into it and feel sadness but joy as she plays through it mm-hmm in remembrance, I, I, there's very few games I could see doing that. Yeah. Like this, this it just, as they said, they, they played it at the perfect time. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the game putting the studio into bankruptcy, Chen feels that from that email alone, it was all worth it. Many of the emails he received from fans told him that Journey helped them deal with loss. Another email he received was from a veteran who became disabled in combat. The game gave him hope to one day go out and live life again to its fullest. Another fan told Chen that at one point, he was clinically dead for two minutes. When asked what those two minutes were like, he said that Journey is the closest thing he can compare it to. That's terrifying. Like, that's crazy to me. Like, that is crazy that you have someone who was clinically dead and you're like, yeah, your video game uh, was my experience with literal death. Mm -hmm. A game about death. Like, that, I, and there's not often where I'm kind of like, at a loss for words when we're talking about this stuff, but that's just crazy when I read that. And I think it still is absolutely insane. Absolutely. And Nintendo designer Shigeru Miyamoto has even tried Journey out, and he told Chen that he loved it, which to this day, Chen states, is one of the highlights of his career. 
The president of Sony Computer Entertainment, Shuei Yoshida, has also stated that Journey was his favorite game of the decade. So they're like, yeah, we kind of bankrupt you. I really liked your game. Yeah. (laughs) After Journey had released, the studio was no longer working with Sony. Furthermore, they knew it would be at least a year before they received any royalties from Sony and had to let some team members go once the game was finished, but not before sending them on vacation. For a while, the studio was in hibernation mode. During this time, co-founder and president of the studio, Kelly Santiago, would leave the studio. As of right now, there are zero plans to create a sequel. That game company felt that the first game is damn near perfect, so why risk screwing it up with a sequel? Many also speculated that it may not be possible without Sony's funding. Yeah, I can I can see that for sure. Yeah, I could see it's especially when you the amount of stress and effort and and creative pouring into this. I mean, how mm-hmm. do you follow something up? You know, how do you how do you make a journey to without being the same thing but in snow or the same thing but in tundra or or, or the- A different element. I think they're right to say we basically perfected this game. Unless you just make a different terrain. Yeah. Okay, we're going to add arms now. But we didn't add arms because they were too distracting. No, I I think if they ever do anything, it has to be a full different game that covers a whole different kind of topic. A spiritual successor more than anything. And I feel like how these games, how they play are all kind of spiritual spiritual successors one upon Mm -hmm. another, essentially. Journey is nothing short of art. It was a game made to defy the norms of multiplayer games. That game company showed the world that they can create a game for those who want to feel something different. They created a game that had you bond with a total anonymous stranger. You felt a connection. You felt like you were not on this journey into the unknown by yourself. Even if you decide to play Journey offline, the world that we are introduced to is nothing short of mesmerizing. The studio went bankrupt just to deliver Journey to the world exactly how they thought it should be. It cost them dearly. The most we could do for them is pick up a controller, surf down hills of sand, and get lost in the world of Journey, making our way towards the top of a mountain, seeking some kind of closure in the ever-glowing light that calls out to us. Now, this is, as always, where we sit back and we talk about why did we choose to talk about Journey? Why is this a game whose backstory we wanted to dive into and flesh out, essentially. As always, Alex, please start us off. Thank you. I think I've already iterated this a lot throughout this episode, um, just because I really do care about this game, not just as a a video game Mm -hmm. uh, or as as a storytelling piece, but just as a piece of art uh, that should be remembered that way. Uh, This is a creative outpouring that led people to sacrifice their career, in a way, Mm -hmm. to deliver... Uh, such an amazing piece of media that can be completed in two, three hours or so, that's totally worth it. Mm -hmm. That uh, can sell you the story, that can make connections. You know, even just, uh, I watched, right before we recorded this last night, I watched through um, a playthrough of it uh, just to get it fresh in the brain again. Mm -hmm. Even just watching someone play through it created that sense of longing and emotion for me. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think is fantastic. Absolutely. I think if you can make a game really do that, it truly stands out. So I, I'm, I'm amazed at what they've been able to come up with this and having it truly hold together, truly stand out and and stand up years, years later is nothing, honestly, short of a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've ever said that yet, but it, it is in an artistic sense, so cool, so fun the puzzles are not challenging in a way that typical puzzle games are. Mm-hmm. It does force you to somewhat think and get through there and do a little bit of platforming. A little bit of looking around. A little bit of looking around and exploring. But that is such like a surface level game element that works so well. It's simplistic in what it's mm-hmm. doing. It's not hard. It's not a, really a challenge. But they let you I don't understand I don't know how to really explain that they let you kind of delve into it in your own way in your own emotions and to truly enjoy the soundscape the little pitter the, I'm, t- I'm gonna bring it up forever the pitter patter of the sand as you walk <laughs> through it it's just it's so calming it's it's done so well in such a desolate area to bring a calm sense well the wind and mm-hmm. seeing the sand react to your feet you know it, this was a game for me that I think I had, I might have saw like a gif on it. Uh, 
a gif of it on Tumblr or something once upon a time. I was like, this kind of looks, I like the art style. I listened to the soundtrack and then I played this and I was like, I kind of regret playing this because it, it just, that emotional sense that they, they want you to feel, it comes out in full force when I play it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so simplistic and it's something I didn't expect. Again, I thought it was going to be this more of an interactive game. I played it offline, so I I never felt that connection with other people, but nonetheless, you still feel very alone in this world and you learn more about the world itself and how this is post-apocalyptic. And then you find yourself, you know, we, we, you had talked about, anger or, or, you know, malevolence when you run into those kind of mechanical snakes that Mm -hmm. changes the flow of the game itself, but still doesn't deter from what it is as a whole. And even that moment where you are shot to the mountain when you almost die is such a, a, I don't know, it's a comeback, but it's this feeling of relief to only then shortly afterwards walk into the light walk into you know let, let's just say death yes uh, uh, it's really something you don't expect you don't play games to go die and this is what this was and then as we were doing research for this and hearing that it changed lives you know mm-hmm. for me i was like oh that you know that game was very good i took the, i that was my takeaway you know great i have a lot more to say no that's, that's all you say <laughs> that game was good and then you put it back on the shelf and never looked at it again but, but, uh the fact that people are saying you know, i'm using this to almost reconnect to a time when my father was still alive you know people saying this makes me want to go back out and live life mm-hmm. you know you have this kid saying that this game is death personified i i don't know if we'll ever have a situation like this again where we're going to have another journey that that will change perspectives truly of what video games could be. We have a lot of games that do that and this is on that list. Absolutely, if not one of the you know top of the list, the forefront of that. Mm-hmm. I think that this game is very special if you can play it. I I can't recommend it enough. Even just go and find it, the the soundtrack online and listen to it just to get a taste of what this game is. And and where it will take you, not even just on screen, but emotionally as well. It's mm-hmm. it's bright, it's vibrant, it's simplistic, it's complex, it's so many things in this short, beautiful package. And I think really, you know, when we started looking into this, first thing that's gonna pop up when you look up Journey in that game company is bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. Yeah. And and I di- I didn't know that. You wouldn't expect that. You see this this, you know, very appealing game. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, this company went under to do this. You know, they've since gone on and produced other games. I don't think any of them are going to have the weight of Journey. No. Uh, and again, I don't think there will be another Journey. Things will come close. I would love, you know, in a couple more years to play the games that are inspired by Journey. I'll have to, I'll have to send some mini tiles your way. If, if you like stuff like this that, that draws... Emotion for kind of like a short story or simplistic gameplay. Mm-hmm. There's a couple out there that really deal with not as not as like abstractly heavy as this, mm-hmm. but that deal with psyche or depression or ideas of loneliness. I need more reasons to be depressed. Exactly. So send them to me. It's just it's just so cool. I'll have to send you some of these titles because they're just so fun in like fighting it or understanding mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. and just so many of those fun areas of gameplay that mm-hmm. add to it it's just it, it just adds so much elements um so many elements to have some fun some fun gameplay with with some heavy backstory behind it mm-hmm. you have to send them my way i will but overall that was journey let's rate let's rate journey mm-hmm. let's let's rate this game Whew. this might be is like a 9.6 or 7 out of me out of 10 this I is, still don't understand your rating scale. This, this is up there. I, I described why I liked this game. Yeah, you've done it for other ones. And you go, nah, it's about a 2.3. <laughs> I love this game. I put seven years into it, but that's uh, about 2.3 because <laughs> I didn't like blocking. So I, uh, I gave it 2.3. Oh, those are for future ratings because uh-huh. I'm horrible at blocking. Uh huh. If I had to rate this game, um, I would probably give it the happiness you have when you slide down the sand because it's buttery smooth. Add in flying carpets that are like Aladdin. Um, which are kind of cool, very stingray, jellyfish like. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, definitely multiply that by like the flappiness of your cape, because that's pretty cool. Then subtract out the serpents, because it gets kind of spooky. It gets very spooky. It's very spooky music too. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's very menacing. I don't like menacing. <laughs> um, quantify the stabilization data of the root square of snow and then add in yourself dying and becoming a piece of cloth out of journey. And that's your official score? What else would it be? Write it down, folks. That is Alex's score along with my score. And that was our coverage of Journey. Research was done by Jesse Reiners and Evan Barr. Cover art by Jesse Reiners and Jessica Welkson. And music written and composed by Evan Barr. Again, cool people. I appreciate them. You know, they're neat. <laughs> they're not the best. but uh, At least I'm neat. You're tolerable, I'll say. You said who cares a couple episodes ago, so. Well, you know, I'm trying to, this is an emotional episode. <laughs> I don't want to destroy you immediately. Um, so I'll destroy you over time. But let's thank those people who do support us and honestly, truly cannot do this without you, and that is our patrons. Mm -hmm. um, to join our Patreon, go to patreon.com slash finish the fight. Um, that is where you can find all the info about the different tier systems we have, the different bonus content you get, bonus shows, post shows, t-shirts, posters, anything like that. If you have any questions, let us know. But let's thank those people today. And we have Charles Zitter, Tactics, Sky the Bear, Angry Canadian, Grant Dillon, Mr. Chuff, Count Fong Feliciano, Alex Harper, Dilfix, Nick Hyman, Richard Scanlon, McChief, Big Papa Semechki, Loki2014, Nathan Van de Voort, Climbing Spork, Mr. 1898, William Kroll, and Cameron Collier. So thank you so much for the support. And like I said, if you have any questions on it, feel free to hit us up. Mm -hmm. And be sure to find us on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, at Finish the Fight Podcast, or on Twitter at FDF Game cast you know shoot us a message if you have any questions about the podcast or any future suggestions as well as if you want a more direct line be sure to join our discord link in the description of you know whatever platform you're listening to it's free for any and all and don't forget to check us out over on twitch at twitch.tv slash sourman70 that's s-o-u-r M-A-N-7-0, where we're doing some various gameplays, we're touching on some of the podcast subjects, we're doing some live events. Uh, let us know what you think of the content, let us know what we should add to it, and we'll get that rolling. And finally, be sure to give us a starred and written review on your favorite podcast platform. We would appreciate it. But as we had said, that was our coverage of Journey. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you feel that emotional weight that the rest of us felt? Let us know in the comments, Discord, you know, uh, social, anything like that. But with that, I'm your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And thank you for tuning in to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Mm -hmm.